Hola, buen día. <laughs> Buenos días, good morning. Thanks all for joining us this uh, Wednesday morning in the first day of Sonar Plus D. I'm Jose Luis de Vicente, I'm the curator for Sonar Plus D, and this is my first opportunity to welcome you all. Uh, thank you especially for making it here to Wednesday morning, because as you know, uh, in case this is not your first Sonar, and as you're going to discover if this is your first Sonar, this is a very long week with a lot of things happening. So saving up your energies for uh, uh, the moments that are really important, I think it's, it's a good tactical decision. And uh, for us, it's actually very, very important this Wednesday when we focus on Sonar Plus D and we actually start sharing together moments uh, to create this small community that is gonna sort of exist for the next four days. We've been talking this morning about storytelling, we've been talking about aesthetics, we've been talking about new emerging spaces and platforms for discussion. And for those of you who were here last year, last year we had a big session right this same morning, this Wednesday morning, right here, uh, about what were starting to be the creative impacts, the transformations that were being pushed by one important technological transition that in the last five years has gained more and more importance. Important breakthroughs in fields like uh, deep learning, machine learning, were creating again after 50 years of pursuing the dream of artificial intelligence, the idea that the future was gonna be linked to the emergence of this uh, force that was also producing new forms of collaboration between creators and non-human systems. And last year we couldn't have it with us who we think is one of the most interesting creators, artists, and practitioners, making the questions about what are the implications of machine learning, deep learning, and, and AI for the work of creators? What kind of forms of creative collaboration are gonna emerge between the uh, union between a creative human input and non-human systems amplifying it, changing it, modifying it. And there's no one better for this, as I say, than Mr. Jean Cogan, who for the last four years, I think, has almost become the person to go to if you wanna actually start the question, what is AI going to do to artists, or how are artists actually gonna be using this set of tools to introduce in a field? He's been teaching hundreds of people literally all over the world to, to dip the feet in the water really when they start to look at this field and he's also going to be, going to be doing it this week here with a workshop he's giving tomorrow uh, which is unfortunately completely full on but for those of you who are going to be lucky to be there I think this is going to be a very very uh, interesting moment for you uh, without much further ado thanks so much for being able to make it this year Jean, Mr. Jean Kogan. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm, I'm really thrilled to be here. Uh, this is my first time at Sonar, and I'm already blown away by the, the size of the festival and the scope. And I'm also really thrilled to be speaking after Zach. Zach is a big inspiration to me. And the way that you can tell is that I've actually compiled my own presentation slide software using open frameworks, which is something that even Zach is not crazy enough to do. So um, I, the, the talk is called The Neural Aesthetic, <clears throat> which is a reference to the new aesthetic, which is this term coined by James Bridal a few years ago that made reference to um, the confluence of digital and physical, uh, dis digital and physical forms, I guess you could say something like that. You know, we, in the years leading up to that term being coined, you, would, you were starting to see that buildings were being designed as like triangular meshes and uh, Google Street View scenes were ready-made art, art ob objects and things like that. And um, the neural aesthetic is uh, talking about the aesthetics of neural networks, which are machine learning algorithms that I've become quite fascinated by over, over many years now. And they, uh, many people think they're, uh, in the next few years, they're going to become omnipresent. And in terms of creating all the digital media that you see, it'll be you know, on, the, on the other side of a neural network. So I'm going to present to you some work that I've been working on the last few years that shows some of the things that you can make, uh, mostly visual forms that you can make with neural networks. And um, the way that I want to start, actually, is to just give you like the basic top-level view of what a neural network is. Um, neural networks have been around for something like half a century now. Uh, and they, they're kind of, um, you could say that they, they look at images and they do a series of transformations of the image. And at each stage, they look for patterns, very small patterns that become bigger and bigger as it goes through the layers. And what you're looking at is a, a diagram from a paper called Neocognitron in the 19, early 1980s. So this is a, the first 
depending on who you ask, it's actually very contentious. The first convolutional neural network, um, that, and, and convolutional neural networks, they look for these kind of small patterns, combine small patterns together into bigger patterns. Those bigger patterns, the yet bigger patterns, and then by the time you're at the end, you're seeing entire object categories. And we've had them for a long time, but we couldn't train them properly. And training means actually figuring, making the neural network work, let's just say. Um, and until really recent years that they became really, really successful. And from the top here, you can see Jan LeCun's um, work in creating convolutional neural networks that can recognize handwritten digits. And then more recently, AlexNet, which is made by Alex Krzyzewski et al. Um, in 2012. And this was kind of the first neural network that created the explosion that we see today. Um, because it, wasn't, it wasn't that long ago that, that you would not have conferences outside of academia talking about neural networks. And this is really how they began to spill over into the commercial and, and uh, industrial realm, actually doing things that, that, that work. Um, and this kind of started, the, started that trend. Um, so like the simplest and most boring example of a neural network, and I often start with it, is handwritten digit classification. So let's say you want to create a machine learning algorithm that looks at an image of a number and tells you what number it is. And you can set up a neural network in the following way. You'd have all of the pixels become the inputs to the net network, and then it would go through these connections to a series of more layer, more, uh, a number of layers of other neurons. And, an e and on the only operations that happen here are uh, additions, multiplications, and max operations, like the maximum of two numbers. So it's actually really, really simple. But there's many, many connections. And so you get this sort of emergent behavior that you uh, see in generative systems. And then uh, you have 10 neurons at the end, and they do something simple like classification. So classification means it sees this 9, and it gives you a high value at 9. Or if you see a 2, you get a high value at the 2 neuron. And at first, it doesn't do this, because we don't know what the, the parameters of this network should be. But in the process of training the network, we actually uh, figure out what those weights, those little connection, those parameters that control the multiplications and additions, what those numbers should actually be in order to get good behavior. And um, one thing, I'd like to show this, this demo that shows a visualization of what those parameters are. So you can actually visualize the weights in neural networks um, that, that uh, go into these, these output neurons. And you see that if it's trained for something like uh, recognition of digits, you see the actual digits appearing within the weights. Like you get these kind of uh, archetypes of the numbers. And this is kind of a hint of things to come. Neural networks are learning representations of things um, that allow you to kind of uh, understand the, the composition of really complicated objects. So neural networks can also, uh, you can do these experiments, which, lets, which let you show what neural networks see. So in, for, for example, you can see that um, this neuron is trained to visualize green patches. This neuron is trained to see kind of diagonal lines, right? This one has patches of pink and yellow, something like that. And these are actual uh, patches of real images uh, that, are, that maximally activated that neuron. And in th those are early layers. And in the later layers, you can see that the neurons begin to learn more and more complicated kinds of uh, feature types. So for example, this one over here, you see lattices or gates or something like that, repetitive shapes here. You kind of see upper bodies over here. I like this. This neuron is capturing text and barcodes and things like that. So they learn, you know, despite variance in colors and, and other kinds of superficial characteristics, it actually learns a, um, a complex object category. So what can you do with this? Um, there's a technique that is kind of best known as Deep Dream. So many of you probably encountered Deep Dream 2015. That was Google's take on this idea of uh, image synthesis uh, using a neural network. So what you can do is instead of sending real images through the neural networks in order to maximally activate a particular neuron, you can actually synthesize fake images which, have, which maximally activate a particular neuron. So if you do that, it looks kind of like this. This is one particular neuron which is trained to look for whatever you want to call these. I see apples, maybe, apple orchards. And you can synthesize an image which when you pass it through the network, the neuron that is trained 
to recognize whatever this thing is, apples, um, is very, very happy. It sees apples everywhere. Um, and, so, and, and you can do this process for any of the neurons in that net network. So for example, here's two more categories looking for these sort of low layer features. And they may not look like anything specific to us, but these are kind of the fragments that get combined into more complicated objects later, later downstream. So you can do this visualization process. And, um, and I'm, just, I'm showing you some of my favorite patches. right? So these are from some of the early layers in the network. And remember, in the early layers, they look for very simple patterns, you know, just edges or you know, patches of colors, maybe, maybe corners, things like that. And so they're very simple. But as you move through the layers, the features that these uh, neurons are able to see become increasingly more and more complicated. So these are kind of medium layer features. You see, start to see entire object categories became, be, become apparent. So like, I don't know, this looks like hair or something like that. Um, I see towers here, maybe wings. I don't know. Uh, you can use your imagination, right? Um, dumbbells. I think these are dumbbells, like for doing exercise, lifting weights. Um, so uh, this is part of a, a, a series of experiments I did that I called neural synthesis. And this is kind of exploiting the deep dream technique, uh, but using it in a slightly different, in an extended way. So what I do here is I'm actually trying to do this process for multiple neurons at the same time. And I'm using these masks in order to uh, let those, uh, let the images grow, let's say, in only a certain region of the canvas. And I can combine these masks together. So here there's two neurons that are being visualized. One appears to look for things like flowers. And then the other one is, I see maybe archways. And uh, you can make these masks that are only on this side, only let in the flower neuron, and on this side only let in the arch neuron. And they're kind of cross-faded together. So you get only a little bit of each in the middle, and you get, you get you know, sort of images that attempt to satisfy both neurons at the same time. So maybe flowery looking arches, or, or maybe arch, archy looking flowers. <laughs> um, and the, the masks, though, there's a lot of room for creativity, because they can be arranged in all sorts of ways. So here they're arranged as sort of concentric circles. And there's three neurons that are being arranged. And sometimes the neurons fade very nicely. Uh, but other times they're, you know, because because maybe you can imagine certain cat you can imagine certain pictures that that look a little bit like both. But sometimes neurons don't mix very well at all. Uh, I think you can see that in oh, in one of them, <laughs> this one right here, yeah, where it seems like oil and water. They just kind of like fight over a border, um, and then blend into each other. This one I really like because it looks like ca cauliflower or something like that. It's the cauliflower neur neuron um, of the network. And you can make video in this technique. So here, what happens is that the, the process of doing these visualizations starts with an input image. So you start with an input image, and then you change its pixels in order to uh, visualize a particular pattern of interest. So to make video, it's really simple. You just take whatever you just created and run it back through the same process. You just make it the input frame to the next version of the, of the, of the, of the synthesis. And uh, again, there's a lot of room for creativity. Besides for just the masks, I can also control the canvas in different ways. So here I'm like rotating the canvas, or stretching the canvas, or shifting it in various ways, maybe distorting it using uh, things like Perlin noise and so on. Later on, uh, I use images as masks themselves. So I like this, the dog noses, yeah, <laughs> fading into the background. Um, later on, I use. Um, actual images as masks themselves. So I think that's over here. Yeah, that's, that's Jan LeCun, and that's Fei Fei Li, who started the ImageNet uh, competition. And these are just kind of like, uh, yeah, there's many, many iterations of this technique. Um, I've got lots more of this sort of eye candy. Um, doing interpolations through time and space of different neurons, and some blend very nicely into each other. And there's so many, so many combinations. And you know, there's, if there's, there's around 7,500 neurons. So if you multiply, multiply them together, there's, there's like 50 million combinations. So you'll never really get through um, testing all of them. I like this one because the, the dog noses look like they're always expanding outward from the center. But if you look carefully, they never go anywhere. It's actually like a, it's a shepherd tone, 
which the, the visual equivalent of a shepherd tone, which is that sensation that you hear pitches rising infinitely, but, but it actually never goes anywhere. Uh, it's kind of the, the visual analog of that. I think I included way too many of these. So. <laughs> oh, um, th these are, and these are pretty fun, and this is actually a hint of some more stuff that I'll show. These are loops. These are actually infinite loops. So if you, if you watch this long enough, you may realize something. These, both of these videos are actually just three seconds long. I'll prove it to you. There's a progress bar over here. So it's just looping. So I figured out a way to make them loop back into each other so that they're kind of seamless. Um, and I've been exploiting this technique quite a, quite a lot. So each of these are just three seconds long. Makes them very nice for social media because <laughs> they, they're only a few megabytes. That's, that kind of gets around some limitations. Another thing you can do is constrain them to an image. So I insert myself in there, look closely, or you might miss it, which is a way of creating weird selfies and things of that sort. Um, lately, this is most recent, I've been exploring texture synthesis, which is very closely related to this technique called style transfer, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Texture synthesis is just contentless style transfer, basically. So this is basically, don't try to find this on the map, it's not real. This is like a, just a, based on a Google map. And again, I can do the same canvas warping technique uh, for this texture synthesis as I did for the Deep Dream. And, and, uh, and the neural synthesis. And you may notice that this is also just three seconds long. So it's, it looks kind of like you're like pinching, pinch zooming into the Google map like forever. And it never goes anywhere. You're just zooming in forever into one Google map and it just, you know, all these imaginary places coming out. So some more aspects of this. I really love this. Of course, the famous the Great Wave off Kanagawa, which is uh, 19th century Japanese, I think, woodcut. Uh, by Hokusai, and again, this is a three-second long infinite wave, just, you know, uh, well, a actually, and, and if you look closely, you see the, the inscriptions, the, the, uh, the kanji here, inscriptions, they kind of emerge every once in a while. That's my favorite part, I think. Um, Kandinsky, Composition 8, All right, so the very, very, I guess, the first truly abstract painting. Um, and I've been doing these collages. So here you'll do the texture synthesis. You'll just throw in all the paintings you can find of a particular artist and um, try to make a collage, like this texture synthesis collage. And so this is Salvador Dali's work. And so maybe it looks kind of like just a, just a I don't know, like a big, big melting pot of all of his works. You can kind of see melting clocks here, if you look carefully, which I think is the most characteristic. Um, Georgia O'Keeffe, very famous for painting flowers. So this is kind of her palette. Um, Jackson Pollock, needs no introduction, just drip painting all over the place. Um, I like the ones by Frida Kahlo because she uh, had a knack for making self-portraits. So you can kind of see like random eyes floating around here. There's a big eyebrow over here, some hair. So uh, Frida Kahlo. <laughs> OK, I want to switch gears to talk about generative models. And generative models are a class of neural networks that produce images and sounds and text that look as though they came from another data set. And, and fundamentally, the thing that really makes them work is, is kind of summarized by this visual. So there's a type of neural network called an autoencoder, which takes a data set of images, let's say of faces, and compresses them into very tiny strings of numbers. And those numbers represent high-level features. And those high-level features try to capture the most salient, the most important parts of those images, such that you can take one of these vectors and then decode them to get back the original image, except it's been corrupted now because you compressed it, right? It's a form of compression. And so you can see that all these faces correspond the, uh, vertically here, uh, but, but the details have been removed. So like, for example, this guy's hat. You know, the, what was on the hat is kind of removed. And this is maybe kind of, you might think is a, a little bit how we, how we perceive things, right? We, you make mental summaries of things and kind of try to imagine things in terms of archetypes because you can't possibly memorize everything in the world. And so an autoencoder is a type of generative model. A more recent kind of generative model is called the generative adversarial network. And these were invented in 2014 by uh, one scientist named Ian Goodfellow, who's a Google brain. And these are really, really weird and really crazy. And it's, and it's kind of, and of course, you know, a sign of the times, right? Because no one in the world conceptualized these at all before 2014. Um, and what these do is, 
it's kind of two neural networks. One is called a generator, and one is a discriminator. And the generator is creating fake images that look as though they came from a particular training set, and a discriminator is trying to tell them apart from the real thing. And the generator is fed by a random noise vector, kind of equivalent to this thing right here, just a random noise vector. Sometimes we call it a latent vector or an input, uh, like a latent input code, something like that. And uh, if you train the generator and discriminator together in a competitive fashion, where the generator is trying to fool the discriminator, and the discriminator is trying to tell apart the, the generator's works from the real thing, um, you get the generator becomes increasingly good at making convincing looking images. The whole competitive part is really interesting, right? It's like the, that's, the, that's why it's called adversarial. Um, you might think of the generator as like a counterfeiter, someone trying to fake artworks, and then discriminators like a police officer or art, art appraiser or something like that. And um, the first version of this that was made to visualize images convincingly was made in 2015, late 2015, in this paper called Deep Convolutional Generative Adversarial Networks, DC GAN. And um, this, this paper really blew my mind for a couple of reasons. Number one, it was the first time, one of the first times that researchers kind of demonstrated something completely new and released their code for it right away. And that was really, really not the kind of thing that you would have expected 10 years ago. People wouldn't do something groundbreaking and then release code open source for it. And they released their code open source, and they demonstrated all these cool features that DC GANs learn. And one thing that's really interesting about them is that this random noise input actually has properties. It has properties that you can visualize. So for example, if you find the latent code which visualizes a man with glasses, it creates pictures of a man with glasses, and then you find the latent code which creates a, just a man, like a man without glasses, and then you add the vector which produces woman, you get man, minus, man with glasses minus man plus woman equals woman with glasses. And this is really crazy. Like this, you could do arithmetic on the features of the, the high level features of the, of the GAN. Um, so I got my hands on this software and I found a data set of handwritten Chinese characters. This was ba basically being used by a university in China for the purposes of handwritten digit recognition. You know, something like, like when you go, uh, I was in China two weeks ago, and I have my Google Translate app, and I can put my phone over top of the characters, and it tells me what they are in English, which is really, really convenient. And to be able to recognize them, you kind of have to do this recognition of, of characters. Uh, but I thought I might do something a little more clever with them. I thought I would run them through a DC GAN. So these are actual samples, handwritten samples, that are collected from many, many subjects in, in, in China. And these are pairs where the, pa the, the item on the left is real, it's actually in the data set, and the item on the right is fake. It's hallucinated by the DC GAN. And you see that it's pretty convincing in most cases, and maybe in some of them it kind of falls apart a little bit, like the complicated characters. Um, but then what's, what's neat about this is then you can then take this latent code and you can make small modifications to it. You can actually just you know, try to sort of gr you know, gradually interpolate between two latent codes and you see these features change gradually. You see maybe like uh, capturing the different ways that people uh, write them, right? So some are more narrow, some are wider, some people put loops around their, uh, around their strokes, things, things of that sort. And you can also <coughs> condition the DC again on the classes, like the actual characters, and do interpolations between the characters. So like, for example, if you look at, these are groups of related characters, eye, face, body, and these are interpolations between them, where every character halfway through, it looks like it could have come from the real data set. And the, the interpretation I've been thinking about this a lot lately is, is um, there's this concept in linguistics that says that, you know, the, the words encode the way that you kind of see, see the world. It's probably not entirely true, but, but it's, it's contentious, but it's, but it's interesting. And the way I think of it is that you have this generative space of all language, like every possible concept that you can form, and words are just points in that space. And they're kind of arbitrary, you know, they're like culturally, they're culturally learned, right? Because you may have, there could be a word that's somewhere halfway between people and culture, but through accident of history, no one ever assigned a character to it. And so I like to think that maybe this is the character that would be, you know, if someone had ever put to, thought to put it on, put it on paper, um, and, and yeah, some, something like that. It's very half-baked, but I'm kind of working it out <laughs> as, I, as I go. 
Another neat thing, I learned a lot about Chinese uh, writing. I got a lot of help from Francis Tseng, who's a frequent collaborator of mine. Uh, I'll talk about ML for A later. And um, I learned about radicals. So all uh, Chinese characters have a root radical. So that's basically a, um, so for example, like person, there's a person radical. And a lot of words have person as the sort of root of the character. So, you know, person from meeting, you know, like a meeting between two people. Now, still, sometimes over centuries, the, the meaning or the connection to the radical is lost, you know, just through, through usage. Um, but, but, you know, like a person who studies, studies these can actually, can actually show this to you. And the cool thing is that the radicals change form because the way that, that it's been written over centuries has changed. And in some of these interpolations, the radical, which I've highlighted in red, kind of stays preserved through the interpolation. So this was a really satisfying project and kind of started it off for me. Um, okay, I want to talk about image to image stuff. So this is kind of like another category of things. And um, the, the most well-known of the, these is like style transfer, which basically takes an input image, like the Mona Lisa, and some style image. We'll call this the content image. The Mona Lisa is the content. And the style image, which is Starry Night. And then you can produce the content image in the style of the style image. And you can see that I, I've been getting like very high resolution with this lately. And um, this is known as style transfer. And uh, I think I yeah, have a demo in, in just a little bit. A more general version of this is, some, is, is uh, used by a, a really awesome software called pix to pix And this is like the Swiss army knife of the, of the deep generative artist. Uh, I've been using this in all my workshops. And, um, and, and basically, you, know, you can think of image filters as things like blur or sharpening. Um, lots, of, lots of generic image filters that, that you can use for various things. And this is like train a, an image filter from examples. So, for, so let's say you want to train a day to night filter. You know, so that's like you have a picture of something in the daytime, and then you can create a filter that will turn it into the same image at nighttime, or maybe colorize a black and white photo, or turn a satellite image into a map, or a map into a satellite image, right? And I used this in a, um, in a, a collaborative project called Invisible Cities, which was basically downloading tiles from Mapbox, which is a mapping service, and, um, and learning a generative model that would produce the satellite imagery from the map tile. So this is like what you see here in the middle is the real satellite image. And then this is the reconstructed version. If you take the neural network that, that takes as its input the map tile and produces at its output the satellite image. And you see the reconstruction is like a little abstract, but it, but it you know, besides for hallucinating its own fake boats, it looks more or less like the, the one in the middle here, right? And um, so, f so you could do a sort of city style transfer. So I can take, for example, a map from Los Angeles and run it through the generative model. This is what it actually looks like. This is Los Angeles. And then this is Los Angeles in the style of Venice. So it's as though Los Angeles map in, in Venice. And you see the roads have become canals. <laughs> and Milan in the style of Venice. And Milan in the style of Los Angeles in Venice. Right? And then you can just throw in anything you want. You can just make up your own maps. And we did this at a, at a place called Open.Lab, which is a, 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 um, a, a, um, like a makerspace in, in Milan. And so just making, hallucinating your own sort of fantasy landscapes. OK, so I got this cool idea from Mario Klingemann, who's a really, really awesome artist, works a lot with neural networks. And he was generating faces from face tracker data. So he trained picks to picks. Uh, he found a collection of faces of sketches from museum, museum data sets. And he extracted all their faces using you know, a face tracker. And then he trained picks to picks to convert the face tracker points into the face. And so for, for this, I decided uh, I, would, I would maybe adapt this idea. And uh, I actually did the same thing, too. Mario's always doing everything first. Um, basically, downloaded a speech of uh, our president in the, U the US, Donald Trump, uh, State of the Union address, extracted his face from it. Uh, and, and then basically put myself in front of the camera. And I'm going to do this now for the first time. I have a, I, because I'm using this laptop for the first time in the presentation, I can actually try. OK, this is, this is what it does. So let's hope it works. <laughs> oh, that's ugly. <laughs> well, 
Now, th this may not make so much sense. Like, why on earth are you doing this? Like, uh, well, <laughs> every time I back away from it, just there's like a headless suit and tie in front of a microphone with a, an American flag in the background. Uh, <laughs> so now, it, it's really worth kind of noting this because it's, it's worth noting this because, you know, we're, we're at the point now where we can realistically synthesize people's faces. So I can imitate Donald Trump. Donald Trump can imitate me <laughs> or any of you. And you can imitate each other's voices now, too. There's a lot of work going into that. So you were entering an age in which this sort of hyper-realistic age where any media about someone can be in entirely made up. And that begs to ask questions like, well, what do we... What do we do about that? Is that something that we're going to have to think about? Because you know, you can think. There's already been a lot of, a lot of interesting use cases, to say the least, and it's something that that we ought to be aware of. Um, getting back to style transfer. So this is style transfer being applied to a video. This is a video I took of the J train, for, in Manhattan, where I, or in Brooklyn, where I lived for a long time, and you can see that you can do it in, with this like consistency. That's really really nice. Like this didn't. You couldn't do this in the beginning. Um, but now there's like much more consistency between frames depending on you know what implementation you find. So this is in the style of Hokusai. And I think if I'm not mistaken, the next one is my favorite, which is as I use for everything, Google Maps. Yeah. And you might notice that the, the markers become windows. Yeah, just hanging onto the buildings. Um, Cubist Mirror, so I think I want, so Cubist Mirror, I'm going to show you a demo, and this is also the first time I've done this on stage, so let's see, let's run this. Cubist Mirror is a, an application which does real-time style transfer on your webcam, so yeah, there I am. Oh, I forgot what the style is, actually. Let's do the Cubist Mirror, yeah. So, everyone say hello. <laughs> Get some other styles in there. I've used this as an installation in a lot of places now. Oh, this one's nice, yeah. <laughs> People instinctively wave. This one looks better with someone right in front of it because you can't tell. It's very abstract. And of course, turning all of you into waves. <laughs> So, <laughs> and of course, yeah, then go. So yeah, well that worked, not bad. Um, yeah, I've had this in a few, a bunch of places. This is this uh, screenshot from most recently. It was at TIFF, the Toronto International Film Festival, and lots of other places. And I want to mention Cycle again. And I don't have any work to show for this, but. It's the latest and greatest thing, and it's related to pix to pix except it removes the uh, restriction that the images that you train on must be paired. So, for example, like if you want to train, you know, uh, if you want to train face tracker to face, you need paired images, like this person's face and then the face tracker at that moment. But let's say you want to train uh, something to turn a horse into a zebra. Um, well, that would be really hard to do with pix to pix because that would require you to get images of horses and zebras in the exactly the same positions. And zebras do not like to be put into positions by people. So you can't really do that, right? So with CycleGAN, removes that restriction. You just get a folder of images of horses, a folder of images of zebras, and lo and behold, you can make a horse that's textured like a zebra, right? And notice also that the, the green grass becomes like a brown savanna. Right, so, there, so there's a little bit of contextual knowledge in there. And also notice that whenever the zebra passes the pole, the pole becomes striped. There it is, a little striping of the pole. And that's because like, the, the zebra, well, it, the, the network can't tell exactly where the zebra ends and the rest of the world begins, right? which, leads it to make to, which leads it to make some very spectacular mistakes. Uh. <laughs> so like, if this wasn't... Ugly enough. Now he looks like, like a like a Marvel Comics supervillain. You know, like zebra zebra man or something. I don't know. Um, okay, interactive stuff. This demo is slightly broken. This is a T snee. Yeah, a lot of these audio samples didn't load. <laughs> a lot of the samples aren't loading. But basically, all the audio samples are arranged spatially in the same uh, so that similar sounds are grouped near each other. So you can kind of play through a sample library. This actually didn't load correctly, so I'll, I'll stop, stop that. 
Um, and uh, the next thing I want to tell you about is Doodle Tunes. So Doodle Tunes is um, an application that I built with a frequent collaborator of mine named Andreas Refsgaard. And what it does is it basically lets you make drawings of musical instruments, and then they, you put that under a camera, and the camera detects what instruments you drew and begins to play Ableton Live to make those instruments come to life. Right? So I draw a little bass guitar and drums. Make a saxophone. It's hard to hear. Keyboard also. And so on. So like I'm really interested in interactive applications. This is one where a person's uh, this is a, uh, uh, like a, an art piece where a performer is making gestures which are recognized by a camera and then are coding an Arduino to make the blinky LED script. So basically writing code with your body. So this is an installation from a couple of years ago. And, and uh, so that's, that's all the work that I want to show you. So I really want to, I'm running out of time, so I really want to quickly tell you about mlfray.github.io, which is an online book as I call it, a book about machine learning for artists. So it contains a few parts to it. I've been working on this uh, for the last two and a half years or so, and it's kind of an ongoing, um, ongoing educational resource. And it started out initially uh, because I was teaching a class at ITP at NYU in spring of 2016. So I started putting together my materials, recording my classes and my lectures, and putting all the notes and software that we made during the class online. And um, I and and actually, and I should, I should note, I'll be doing this again in this fall. So I'll be doing a new version of this. Uh, but basically, in the process of doing this, at some point, I decided I would kind of expand the scope of this project and start to include things like instructional guides. So these guides show you how to do various things, you know, basic like creative applications of machine learning uh, and of neural networks. And some of these are kind of Python-related guides. Others are actually built using open frameworks. Um, as I mentioned earlier, and, and then also these are just some of the guides. So for example, the one in the top right is Doodle Classifier, which is the back end of Doodle Tunes, which I showed you, the, the application which recognizes musical instruments, and um, things like T-SNE, drawing, uh, drawing applications. I have a collection of open frameworks apps um, and lots of, lots of demos online. Um, and also a book in progress, which is kind of like I write maybe one week every six months. So it's kind of a really big work in progress. And I've been having a lot of workshops, as mentioned, have two this week, including one at UPF. Um, and uh, I've had lots over the years. Um, and that's all. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Jim, for yeah. your amazing body of work and sharing it with us. We have time for maybe a couple of questions. I had one very few. Oh, I had one very fast. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a set of techniques and methodologies that have evolved incredibly fast in, let's say, the last five years. And things that you show today seem completely impossible to do five years ago. Out of your own gut feeling and intuition, what do you feel that you might be able to be doing in, let's say, five year times that you still cannot do today? In five years? Yeah. Uh, it's really hard to make predictions about the future. There, there's a lot of there's a lot of reasonable uh, reason to believe that we'll have like very realistic synthesis of images. So you know, like I showed you the Trump thing, but and that looked kind of not believable. No one would actually believe that was him. But there's prototypes of this that are much more realistic. I would also say a lot of stuff in natural language processing is you know like language translation. I would I I think here's a prediction. I think in five years you'll be able to go to another country and have an earpiece that is like someone can speak into in a different language and it'll translate it on the fly. In, and there's already prototypes like this. I don't think they work very well, but in five years, it'll be like having a conversation with someone in your own language. I think that's something, yeah. Five years, we're holding you. <laughs> uh, we're keeping that prediction in a box and, uh, and, yeah. and see five years from now, how do you do? But something actually very interesting and, and I don't know how related to this juxtaposition in the future is how the status of the image of, of, the, uh, of the visual is changing so fast to the point where you may soon not be able to really 100% being able to trust that any video yeah. is a realistic <coughs> natural video. How, how do you feel? We've just gone through the whole uh, uh, earthquake of the, of the fake news idea. Uh, how is a world yeah, right. where fake news <laughs> also includes fake images? Yeah, yeah uh, that's a hard 
hard one. I think like it's a security nightmare. Yeah. It's like all of you know being able to make up make somebody up. I think in the future you're probably going to have to like authenticate everything that you share online somehow. Um, and oh, it's, it's hard question, because people are going to use that for everything you can think of, and not all of it's going to be good. I also think there's interesting implications for art, because you know, in when we were able to finally like make realistic looking paintings, there, that was kind of what led abstraction to become a, a form of painting, right? And then the same thing happened in photography at some point. Abstract photography came out, and I think maybe like, like when this happens to neural networks, or as Mario calls it, uh, neurography, I think you'll see you'll start to see kind of like an abstract phase of, of, of neural art emerge. I think <laughs> we have time for questions now. Comments? We have one over here. Uh, <coughs> very 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 nice presentation. Y you used the word hallucination a couple of times. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What do you think it means for our visual system that those hallucinations are not unlike the ones we have when we take? certain substances? You would expect that they're not unlike them because they're trained on data sets that are labeled by humans. So they should correspond to some degree of how we perceive the world, how we label things. Um, and and you, you might say that you know, the, the models, the way they're designed, they are, this is, shouldn't be exaggerated, but they are trying to capture a little bit how how this is done in the brain. You know, you try to form a mental model of things, and it's kind of abstract. You know, you, you try to see patterns that are fit together. You know, the way that I recognize a cat is kind of some eyes and whiskers and a, a tail, um, objects coming together. And there's actually a lot of evidence that that's how the human visual system works. Um, so you'd expect there to be the, some overlap. Um, but maybe all, a lot of it is us projecting also. Maybe, maybe it doesn't work exactly how, how we do, because we, we hardly understand ourselves anyway, so it's hard to necessarily say for sure. Have another one? Let's see here. I can look to you here. Yes, here. First slide. Uh, Jen, amazing presentation. And going back on, on, like, you know, on the fake news, would we be able to train for, you know, the machines to recognize fake news? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, in, in principle, you, you can, but, but that's going to be really contentious. I mean, who decides what fake news is? Um, per personally, I think real news is more of a problem than fake news, actually. So, but, 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 but yeah, I mean, who label, gets to label what is fake news and what is real news? And it's it's going to be rough. I think, I think things won't change in, in principle, like the way that we have to approach these problems. It really is still like kind of a human problem, not so much of a machine problem. Um, but yeah, I don't know. The future is very uncertain. So yeah, thank you, everybody. Thanks, Jean. Okay. And actually, good luck with a couple of workshops that you're going to be doing yep. this week. And see, see, you, see you tomorrow. In the next session. Thank you, thank you everybody. Okay. Thank you.